Coming to you live from the infamous Red Room, it's the Movie Change Up Podcast Disney Plus Weekly Review, where every week me and my co-host Tristan uh, break down this week in Disney Plus. The episode's uh, one day later than normal, but we both had some stuff come up, so we had to delay the episode. If you haven't seen our show before, basically we watch pretty much everything that comes out on Disney Plus. And kind of tell you whether you should watch it or shouldn't watch it. Maybe you got Disney Plus because you wanted to watch Loki or uh, any of the other Star Wars or Marvel shows. And now you just have it. Maybe you bought a year plan and you're like, what do I do now? Maybe you have the Hulu ESPN Plus Disney Plus bundle. And you're like, what am I supposed to watch now? And that's what we're here to tell you to watch. Or just skip. Uh, Tristan, it was a very <laughs> late week on Disney Plus. Uh, hopefully things start to pick up. We're going to get... Uh, Hawkeye here in about a month, but what were your thoughts kind of on Disney Plus? Yeah, sure. It was a light week in terms of amount of content, but I did think the quality was pretty good. You know, we're going to talk about the two headline drops, and I thought both of them were pretty solid entries and stuff that I got something out of. And I'm I'm looking forward to the conversation. You we mentioned now this show is for people who have the membership, we don't know what to watch, and we kind of want to give them recommendations, and this not, might not be the week for that, because <laughs> yeah. there wasn't much new, in terms of new stuff, dropped this week, but, you know, uh, that's kind of the cost of a streaming, pack, a streaming service once in a while, you're going to get these weaker weeks before we get to stuff that we actually are paying for, like Hawkeye, so yeah, a bit of a slower week for new drops here. Yeah, I definitely think uh, pandemic kind of pushed a lot of things back, because I think 2020, 2022 is going to be a big year for Disney Plus, I think, for a lot of the casual fans. I think every week there's either going to be a Star Wars show or a Marvel show dropping in some weeks. I think you're going to get both. Yeah, Um, it's going to be a huge year next year. So this is only the taste the beginning, Joe. So uh, I'll I'll appreciate these several weeks because I have a feeling we're going to get to weeks where it's like, okay, what we have to cut something because we can't talk about it all. (laughs) Yeah. All right, uh, so speaking of Marvel, let's kick it off with the uh, drop this week, which is the the behind-the-scenes documentary about the recent Marvel movie uh, Black Widow, which also just premiered uh, permanently on Disney+. Uh, Marvel Studios Assembled Black Widow is the name of the documentary. And it's very just kind of light thing. It doesn't go too deep. It just kind of goes into, like, why they made the movie and a little bit into how and just kind of, like, some fun facts, basically. I thought, like, honestly, I like, I think this is the first one they've done based on a movie. Uh, all of the, uh, the previous three were all based on the shows that dropped on Disney+. Plus. And honestly, like, I wasn't really intrigued by it. Like, there wasn't really anything that I essentially didn't already know. I feel I think it was all just very kind of general, generic stuff, and it was a little disappointing. But what were your thoughts? Yeah, it was very service level. And I was thinking, like you said, for the movies, they might bring a bit more out. And especially when you get to the end, you, you want to get like an idea essentially of like what's next for the characters in a bit of a way like that. And I didn't get any of that really from this, but I did get some nice insight into the thought process behind some of the choices. And I know we weren't huge fans of the movie, so I think that might have. Uh, hurt this yeah. a bit because you were going into it without like the excitement of saying oh I can't wait to see how they did this or that and it but uh, like a lot of these behind the scenes documentaries this did kind of enhance the movie for me just getting the idea of okay the Taskmaster for example was a character in the original movie that didn't work for me at all and uh, I wasn't wasn't necessarily because of the changes they made but just because I didn't think that there was much going on with the character and I thought the action was particularly good with the character but seeing like they're, they're, how much they went to the action and kind of like the thought, like, oh, where does the shield come from? It's not really attached to his body. It kind of is like this magnetic thing. And that kind of level of detail is stuff that I don't necessarily notice in Marvel movies. But when they kind of get to sit there with the costume designer and just, yeah. oh, yeah, like we had this blue here that was like this really detailed blue. And we like were thinking, oh, well, we got to figure out the practicality of where these uh, weapons are on the Taskmaster's suit so that she could pull out the bow and have it look natural without having to be a bow on the costume. And that was the kind of stuff that really enhances it for me, just getting that detail. When I go and I watch Taskmaster scenes again, I'm probably going to be looking for stuff like that and and enjoying it more than I otherwise would have. Yeah, I will say the costume uh, department section of the documentary was my favorite part of it, just talking about, you know, her who's the I can't remember the costume designer's name, but just like her who has a lot of experience in this field. And talking about like all her decisions and everything that went on into designing all of the characters' costumes, 
was re- was really my favorite part of it. And I think that's why it was kind of a relatively big part of it. While most of the other most of the other documentaries, it's like five minutes for this was like ten to fifteen minutes. I felt. Yeah, they they really did an interesting job of balancing what they thought people would be interested in talking about because the action of Black Widow was kind of unanimously the worst part of it for people. So they kind of saved the action for like, <laughs> it was shockingly light on like the action behind the scenes stuff. There's a lot into like the the creative process and like, oh, we wanted this for the characters and we wanted to like uh, really show this, the, the themes. And it was, I thought they kind of shy away from the action, I think intentionally, but I think it also improved the action a bit for me. Not necessarily the big scope action, like the jail sequence and that kind of stuff, but uh, Florence Pugh mentions a like a Bourne comparison, and I think it the the uh, the fight to fight person to person action sequences in Black Widow were quite good, and it was good, fun to watch like Florence Pugh and Scarlett Johansson kind of getting in getting in preparation for that and saying like, oh, you know, the Marvel fights are usually kind of operatic and kind of fun. But this is like two people who are trying to kill each other, and there was like a veracity to it, and I appreciated that too. And there are like that's what I like about these is like they give you little things where when I go back and watch Black Widow someday, I'm gonna probably get a bit more out of it than I otherwise would have gotten out of it, just because you see like the care and the work that went into the something that, even though I didn't necessarily love everything about it, there are stuff like the characters that I really liked and stuff like the the themes of. Uh, making choices for yourself. I, I thought this documentary really got into the inti- the intent of those themes, even if they didn't necessarily work perfectly for me. Yeah, I agree with that. The action was interesting, and one of the things I did like uh, was when they were talking to John Favreau, and he's like, when they brought Black Widow on for Iron Man two, and they were experimenting and doing all these different fight styles. The one that stuck out to Scarlett Johansson and she thought worked the best was Lucha Libre was not, which wasn't anything John Favreau really expected, but he thought like the high flying, like flips and twists when it's done by a female, uh, character really works. And it, you know, makes the fights believable rather than just like standing up and punching, you know, going toe to toe with like these supposed like six foot five, like built out henchmen that the flips and, you know, scissor kicks and all those things work better. Mm-hmm. And I like too. They had the the young widows. I don't remember what they were called in the movie. Like the the whole group of widows, I guess. And they talked about how they had this ballet inspired kind of movement to their action. And I thought that was really interesting. Of course, it was obvious in the movie they were going for that. But to see them like actually sitting there with like dancers essentially and going through the dance moves and saying like, okay, we need you guys to grab the gun in like this natural dancing way. How do we like work that into the movement so that it doesn't look unnatural and I think that was really cool too. You mentioned the action and like how Scarlett Johansson was kind of inspired by a very specific combat form. And this was also inspired by a very specific uh, combat form. So it was interesting to see the, I don't think too much about like, Oh, what is the form of fighting that she's using? I'm like, Oh, she's like punching the guy and then she's kicking the guy. (laughs) But like the fact that all that thought is put into it, it really does enhance what you're looking at. I think. Yep. Uh, All right. You ready? You got anything else you want to say about this? Are you ready to move on? No, I'm ready to move on. I, I always like these uh, these behind the scenes documentaries. Where would you put this among the the ranking generally? Would you put this at the bottom Probably, of the Marvel yeah. behind the scenes ones? Yeah, I think part of it too is that's like because they've only other only ever done the show, so it's like you're doing a documentary about two hours of content rather than like six to eight hours of content. And I think that's yeah. part of the difference is you just have less to cover and less to talk about. I also felt like there wasn't much particularly unique about the production of Black Widow. Like, it was just pretty much shot like you shoot every Marvel movie, you know? And there was certain things that were unique about it. The action was unique. Some of that stuff was unique to be mentioned. But the TV shows, I think, really stood out because, one, it was something totally new to see, like, a full-blown Marvel production TV show with this level of budget. But there was, I think, each of the shows had their own kind of unique stylistic thing that was going to be interesting to see how they pulled it off, whether it was, like, the this the sitcom kind of thing that Marvel or the WandaVision was doing, like that made me really, really want to see how they're going to pull it off or the sci-fi big scope universe stuff of Loki. I wanted to see how they pulled that off. But Black Widow, I thought, yeah, they pulled it off. Like they pull off most action movies and that's pretty much what it was, you know? So I didn't feel like I was gaining a lot of insight. I think that was the weakest part, but I definitely enhanced the movie. So I recommend it if you're a bit, if you're a fan of Black Widow for sure. But if you're not into Marvel, I would definitely wouldn't say this is going to be like the one that yeah. turns you around. And you say, oh, maybe I should watch 
Black Widow. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely feel like if you're a fan of Black Widow and you like the MCU, check out this. And if you haven't checked out the other Marvel Studios Assembled documentaries, check those out too if you watch those shows. But yeah, if you don't really care about Marvel, this is not like a documentary that's going to make you be like, oh, maybe I should check out these Marvel projects. Yeah, this is definitely a thing for the fans and like a, a, a puff piece for the movie. Yeah. All right, so our next topic, uh, we're going to cover a show we've been talking about since episode one, and not a show that I thought, and I don't think Tristan thought either, that, you know, six, seven episodes in, however many episodes we're on now, that we'd still be talking about. You know, we talked about uh, Turner and Hooch Hooch for the first few episodes, but after a while, we're like, it's kind of the same thing over and over. We don't really need to cover it anymore. Uh, But uh, here we are. Uh, We're, you know pretty deep into the season and it's uh doogie kame aloha md this episode was titled momentum and essentially uh the main plot of this episode is a new doctor uh is visiting the hospital uh played by max greenfield who people might know from new girl and i believe he's also in promising young woman and he's kind of this hot shot doctor that's more about the prestige and the fame and all of the things that come with being a doctor rather than actually helping people. And uh, Doogie being a, you know, 16 year old at heart, I mean, and, and in actuality, uh, regardless of the fact that she's a doctor, is like super impressed by him and he's offering this fellowship and Doogie really wants to do it, but the mom doesn't want her to. She's like, I know Doogie came to this you know, became a doctor because she wants to help as many, many people as possible. Like that's not, you know, podcasting and this whole thing isn't really why she wants to be a doctor. And, you know, it's basically the mom struggle of like, do I stop her from doing it or do I let her make the decision on their own? And that's kind of the big struggle. And then the B plot is the dad, uh, is entering a surf contest that happens every year. And for the first time, he is put in the Sunset Division, which is the 45 and over group. And he's like, I shouldn't be in the old man group. I'm not an old man. And it's kind of him coming to terms with the fact that he's aging. And, you know, like we've said a hundred times, this show is a quintessential family show. And the fact that both plots really revolved around the parents while the kids took a back seat, I think, uh, shows that. Uh, but what were your thoughts on this episode? You mentioned last week that it was kind of a kiddie episode and it was very focused on the kid plots and it felt like it wasn't aimed at us and we thought, oh, this is the first time the show has not been for us. You know, it was something we kind of said for last week. And this one, like you said, it was focused on the parents and I think I think it was most intentionally like that. It feels like a response to last week where last week was very much about the kids and this is like, okay, now the parents get their episode. And this one worked a lot well, a lot better for me probably because of that. Like I'm much more... I'm not in the social division quite yet, mm-hmm. but I'm uh, much uh, more towards the adult side than the teenage side in terms of maturity. But uh, I've always said that the mom plot and the hospital kind of plot is what I liked so yeah. much about this in a way that I never expected that I would. So this was definitely a good episode for me. It was very much about that plot. And I love the, Sh- the Schmidt character. I don't know what the the character's name is, but he's played by Schmidt from New Girl. And he Something gives a very Goldstein, Schmidt. But... Yeah, it's a very, very Schmidt performance here. Uh, he's very arrogant and cocky, and he thinks the world revolves around him, and everyone in the hospital is kind of enamored by him, and he's so attractive. And, yeah, it was a really fun character. I like that this show, it could have uh, it could have easily been like, oh, doctors are perfect people. They do nothing wrong, and everything is perfect about doctors. And, and then this is like, yeah, doctors are great, but also, like, once in a while, there's, like, these doctors who are just really arrogant and uh, only care about themselves. And... Uh, are just kind of selfish and want to make money, and I think that they capture the like the like the duology. Like I don't know the the variety of people who could be doctors, and yeah. I think that generally is what the show is about. That you can't, you know, you're not just one thing. I think this is really interesting, and I, I can go on. But yeah, I thought that was a good episode because it was very focused on the hospital side of things, which I liked. But I also liked the B plot too, which you could talk about. But yeah, what were you gonna say, Joe? Yeah, I was gonna say I like that they captured like he's like about himself and he has the podcast but at the end of the day like he wasn't a bad guy like he wasn't the villain of the episode or anything he was just maybe the antagonist you know something that the mom had to work against but it wasn't like like i didn't come out of that episode being like ah screw that guy that guy sucks it was more just like oh that guy has his way of doing things and it's different but i don't know if it's necessarily like wrong he didn't like accidentally kill a patient with his arrogance or anything he was just like he had a podcast and he's about that life and he's not really you know 
Yeah, I definitely got the vibe like he wasn't a villain. He wasn't malicious. He wasn't coming in and then it turns out he doesn't even know how to do surgery. He's lying the whole time. <laughs> you know, like that could have been the easy twist to do and make it easier to say, oh, yeah, he's definitely the bad guy. But he's still kind of an ar arrogant guy who uses the medical field for his own ways, his own gain, and promotes his own products with it. And I think, yeah, I like that it wasn't just, oh, and then he's evil at the end. And you're like, oh, okay, that's easy. <laughs> Uh, I like that he has his way of doing things, and I would say it's probably the, the wrong way to do things. It's probably not the most, like, emotionally healthy way to do things. It's probably not the most, like, medically moral way to do things, but it's his way to do things. And I, I like that the mom had this plot of, like, okay, I know that this is not the right choice for my daughter, and I know that she probably will learn that lesson and probably step away from this eventually, but, like, where's my place to let her grow up and my place to let her go because the whole episode is pretty much about like their relationship and how close they are and how easily that could change too if one of these women doesn't go in the direction they want to go in life you know and I I think I love this relationship too but I want to move on to the B plot too yeah. because I don't want to let yeah. them hang yeah I... <laughs> I'm gonna say right now Benny the dad lives my dream he just hangs out makes lays all day with the flower not the chip and uh, just sells snow cones, and I don't think he's had a single customer the entire series. And he lives, like, a fun, stress-free life just married to a doctor. And I didn't realize that, you know, living in Hawaii selling snow cones and lays was my dream until the show started, and now that is my dream. I want to marry a rich and successful doctor and just sell snow cones on the beach. Look, you're dressed like it, Joe. I can yeah. see you're in, you're in I'm character a Hawaiian, right now. It's a Hawaiian-themed Halloween shirt. You got zombies and the jack-o'-lanterns. I don't know if you can fully see it. Our pineapples. And uh, you got, like, black trees and stuff. And candy corns. It's a Hawaiian-themed Halloween shirt, you know? I was really so, impressed by that, Joe. You hit so all, I, the, all, the, all the marks there for the episode. So, you know, it's Halloween time. We got, we're talking about Doogie Kame Aloha, which is set in Hawaii. I'm like, I have to wear this shirt. Number one, it's probably my favorite shirt. And so I am thought, why not wear it on the podcast? Probably wear Joe, it next you, week, too. I got to get some get, get myself some Hawaiian shirts for our Doogie uh, reviews, but... Yeah. Yeah, the B plot I thought was good. I mean, the uh, better than a lot of them. But honestly, I would honestly say this is one of the better of the of the side stories. Usually, so the side stories can be really dumb sometimes, and be or they're or like the the side stories, like the actually interesting part of the episode, and the B plot is, is the bad part. And I think this episode, I actually felt like both plots were really, really strong. I like that the guy, the dad, is experiencing this moment in life where he's realizing, oh, I'm past my prime, and I'm trying to recapture it, and. Uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to. You know, it's it's a it's a interesting too because my parents just turned sixty this year, so like they're in a similar boat where they're like, oh wow, I'm old. Like, what, I gotta like uh, figure out what I'm doing now. And I think it was kind of funny to see the the dad go through a similar moment here where he's like, no, I'm still the big tough guy who was wooing all the women in Hawaii. And I thought it was fun to see him. He doesn't totally lose though. He's not like he. I like that they don't make him out to be like a buffoon old man. He's still competent. You know, he's still physically fit. He's still successful. Yeah. He's just like this fun, goofy dad, and he's living my dream. He is. He's living our dream. I mean, he told me on that life, you know, he's married to the most independent, like, successful woman he can possibly find. She's, like, at this high-end hospital job, and he's just like, yeah, I'm, you know, selling shaved ice. Yeah, I'm it's, selling snow cones to zero so customers. Snow cones. I haven't seen yeah. it. Like a, the one thing I will say about this show is we've seen every, like, dynamic in this family through various episodes. Like, there's been times where, like, we've seen episodes with both Lahela and her mom and her dad. There's been episodes with Lahela and her slightly younger brother, maybe older brother. I, I, I haven't fully... I can't fully remember who's the oldest in the family, if Lahela's the oldest or that one brother's the oldest. You know, we've seen... All, all, the parents interact with all three sets of kids. The one dynamic we haven't really had is Lahela and the youngest brother. That's the that's the dynamic I want next because we haven't really seen it that much, if at all. Yeah, I definitely think that's the way they're gonna go at least because maybe not next week, of course, but like at some point in the season because they have, like you said, changed up the dynamics a bit to give us each of the characters together in different episodes. Obviously, Doogie and the mom are like the traditional. Uh, character, yeah. I would think, to be together for most of the episodes, and then the the sons and the dad are kind of like the normal dynamic of an episode. 
So when they switched up, it does feel unique. So it would be fun to see them give her some time with their younger brother. We got a Walter appearance this week, Joe. Yeah. yeah, every time we get a Walter appearance, it's the best part of the episode. I don't even really remember what his... I know he was in like the super beginning, and I was excited because I thought he'd be in more of the episode, but he was really just kind of in the beginning. Uh, I want more I laughed Walter. out loud when I saw Walter this week because the, the, the dad is trying to do this... Uh, this, uh... Oh, yeah, he was trying to surf, and the kid was like, yeah, come surfing with us, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the dad's trying to go surfing in the surfing competition, and uh, Walter shows up, and he's like, hey, we're still going out, even if there's a red flag, we're going out. And then the dad's like, cool, I'm going to go out too with you guys. And I was like, oh, awesome, we're going to get like a dad versus Walter, like, they're going to get... See, I think a, the like show a... <laughs> would change it up, and it would not, like, you say, like, dad versus Walter, and it's like, oh, this is the guy that's dating my daughter, I got to prove it's better. Where I feel like that episode, if we ever get, like, a dad and Walter together episode, it's just going to be, like, them hanging out. Yeah, I was like, thinking like a friendly competition, like oh, they're both trying to like outsurf each other because they're trying to be cool. You know, I wasn't thinking like oh, he's dating my daughter. I was like, oh, these guys are gonna have like yeah, a cool. I want a fun cool hangout moment, episode. You know? Okay, number one, Benny is of the characters that are actually in this family and mainly on the show. Benny's my number one, and then obviously Walter. I want a Benny and Walter hangout episode where like maybe you... they go out and do something and like they car runs out of gas and they get stranded and they're just hanging out all episode that's my dream episode for this show there's not even we a b came plot. so close there's we not... almost got it this week yeah there's not even a b plot it's just benny and walter the whole time i'm mainly enamored at a 16 year old boy named walter that's mainly why he's my second favorite character i, I really want to talk with the you know creators of the show and ask why they decided to name a 16 year old boy walter but i also like that uh, his daughter's boyfriend shows up and he's like, "Hey, we're about to go and endanger our lives swimming against the guards against the lifeguard orders. Do you want to join us?" And the dad's like, "Yeah, that sounds <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That's what my teenage daughter's boyfriend should be doing." Yeah, it's Benny. He he lives his own life. True, you know, it's it's. it's I love that character. He does have that kind of like hang loose kind of cool guy vibes to him. You know, he fits perfectly for the show. He's everything I want to be. All right, uh, we've talked about this. You ready to move on to our next topic? Yeah, I'm ready to move on. Another good episode of Doogie. Probably up there is one of my favorite episodes of the show, if not my favorite. Yeah, for sure. So next I had the uh, topics all lined up. We were all ready to go. Uh, I made our little background. If you're watching this on YouTube, had it set up. So it said over there, or no, over there. I had uh, Marvel Studios Assembled Black Widow. Then I had Doogie Kame Aloha MD, Momentum, and then just over there. By itself, I had Ahsoka news. Immediately after I hit save, I go on Twitter, and what's the first thing I see? Boom, new Hawkeye poster dropped, and since it was a light week, I decided to add that in. Uh, so let's talk about this, and if you're watching, I will pop it up on screen. So, obviously this poster, it's a relatively simple poster. You can tell it's Christmas-themed. We got Kate Bishop, played by Haley Steinfeld, and Clint Barton, a.k.a. Hawkeye, played by Jeremy Renner. And then, obviously, this uh, nice golden retriever in a Santa hat. It's telling us, you know, two-episode premiere, streaming November 24th. Uh, so, there will no longer be a crossover with, or not a crossover, but, like, the finale of Hawkeye and the premiere of Book of Boba Fett will no longer be on the same day. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of a simple generic poster uh i'm not fully up on my bridges to tell which bri which <laughs> city that is in the background uh i'm gonna guess new york because everything mcu seems to be new york except for ant-man which i believe is san francisco but that doesn't look like san francisco so i'm gonna assume most of this show is set in new york and uh i'm also sticking with my theory that Hawkeye doesn't make it home for Christmas, and him missing Christmas with his family, along with everything else that happens, is him deciding once and for all that he needs to put his family first. He's done everything he needs to for the galaxy, for the universe, and he hangs it up because now there is another Hawkeye that can take his place, and that is Kate Bishop. I like it, Joe. I like your theory. I'm really excited to run into the show with that theory. It's gonna be in my head the whole time. Like, is he gonna make it in time or not? You know, and I have the added baggage of is Joe going to be right or not? You know, because that's gonna to add to the drama. I think. Yep. But yeah, I like this poster. Like I've said a couple of times, I'm really looking forward to the show. I have right here the uh, the comic book that I've 
is sure to be a large influence for the for the show itself. Uh, they've been using kind of the aesthetic of the comic here for a lot of the marketing, so you can see I have on comics there. too. Yeah. Mine's different. Mine's just a yeah, mine's shield not... comic about the history of shield, but and like when you scroll through here, you can see like literal moments from the trailers and stuff like that. So they're definitely taking influence, and I, I like the dog is in that uh, shot as well, the poster as well, because there is a dog uh, pretty prominently featured the, in the what, comic book series. What's the deal with the dog? Is it like Kate Bishop's dog? Is this the Barton family dog? Like whose dog is this? What's this dog? Well, in the comics, it's uh, Clyde Barton. He, he has not Clyde. Clint. <laughs> Clint Barton. I got my core crossed over with my my Marvel, but yeah. Uh, he he. In the beginning of the comic, it's essentially him kind of nursing this dog back to life, and okay. the entire first issue is like he finds this dog and heals him back, and it kind of like becomes his dog for a while. And I think it it it's very much like a street level show where it's like Hawkeye trying to solve these street level problems, and he's like, I'm an Avenger but yet I'm still like this old broken man who doesn't, who's like fallible and do I still have a place in like this world of superheroes, you know? And so I think your theory is pretty, uh, uh, apt that he, may, I'm sure this is going to be an ending to Hawkeye's story, which is, uh, like a finale to him essentially stepping away in some way, whether it's to be with his family or to be like in some kind of separate role. But yeah, I think this will be an end to, to Jerry Renner as Hawkeye. We're going to see Haley Steinfeld truly step up and become the lead. And, yeah, the poster definitely aims towards this comic and this aesthetic, and I'm looking forward to that. Plus, the Christmas theme on top of it, like you give me Christmas, you give me a, and a great comic book storyline, and you give me Haley Seinfeld, like <laughs> you give me everything I want in this show, Joe. Yeah, one of the things too, like if you they do a thing where it's like, oh, he just wants, you know, he decides he needs to put his family first, spend time with his family, and so he retires as Hawkeye. I feel like you could still bring him back at some point. Like, could you imagine? the next big Avengers movie, they need to hide out somewhere. And Scott Lang's like, oh, I, I know a spot. Or, you know, uh, uh, Captain America, Sam Wilson is like, oh, I know a spot. And they go to Hawkeye's house and he's there. And they kind of have like like a Rambo, like a, what was that, Rambo Last Blood moment where like they invade the Barton household and Clint has all of these contraptions and stuff set up. Come on, tell me your mind wouldn't be blown and you wouldn't be like, this is the most amazing Marvel moment of all time. <laughs> I'm super into that. I love to see like a Home Alone thing. You know, he's got this, all these booby traps set up. He's been ready to go. You know, he's got it, he's got it set. Yep. I like how we extrapolated this. all of this from a poster with there are three, two main characters and a dog on it. Yeah, but it's purple, Joe, and there's a bridge in the background, you know, and yeah, and Christmas. It's Christmas, you know. And Christmas, you're right. There's a lot, a lot to get from this poster. Yep. All right. Anything else you got to say about this poster? <laughs> no, I don't think it's one that'll be hanging up on my wall no, anytime I mean, it's, soon. It's not like bad, but... but it's not like wow, this is an amazing piece of art or anything. But it's not like yeah, bad. But, it's not a, at least it's not a tower of heads like most Marvel posters. I'm sure we'll get better posters as we get closer and closer. And like I wonder if like they did for like Mandalorian if we'll get character posters as they'd introduce characters and that kind of stuff. Because there is a Christmas, a Christmas aesthetic to this comic or to this show rather. Yeah. So and I, I would think they'd have some of that in the marketing more so than just oh there's lights on the bridge in the background kind of. Yeah, and like they played a Christmas song in the trailer, I believe. I could be wrong, but I believe it was a Christmas song in the trailer. Uh, but yeah, Disney Plus for both Marvel and Star Wars has been like their big shows have been releasing character posters each week depending on who was in the episode. And so I imagine like the first poster will probably be Clint Barton, second poster Kate Bishop. You know, if there's a big dog episode, the dog will be the character poster. Yelena from Black Widow will probably oh, get a poster. Right. Maybe that's like the series finale poster. It's a good week to we watch Black Widow behind the scenes, I guess, because I forgot that she's definitely showing up in this. And then yep. we're gonna it'll be interesting too, because like they have the whole history of Black Widow. So yeah, I'm looking forward to the show a lot. I don't know how much on the writer are people generally, but a good word of mouth could definitely put it on there. Like I don't think people were ca caring about WandaVision or Loki, the general audiences, until suddenly everyone was talking about them and they realized they had to watch them. You know, so I think if this captures the people's interest. It could be a big hit for him. Yeah, what's uh, what's your uh, prediction on any other Marvel characters showing up in this show? Hmm. I definitely think we're going to get 
Madam Hydra, or what, what, what they're calling her in the show. I don't know what they've even named her. Julia Louis Dreyfus's character. Julia Louis Dreyfus's character. But I think she's definitely going to be like essentially the evil Nick Fury of these Disney Plus shows going around gathering up the bad guys for her own will. So I could see her having a rather prominent role in this. I could also see Sharon Carter showing up too. I could see this being kind of like a, a gathering of the forces in this in a way for this kind of spy side of Marvel. I don't see them having big roles, but I could see especially towards the end as the plot inevitably gets bigger and bigger that they're going to be like essentially the law enforcement side of it or something like that. I could see them tying in some way to the larger plot because we know Yelena does too. So Hydra, Madam Hydra is tied to that somehow. Yep. And I think Power Broker is tied to all of it. So yeah, I think Sam Wilson's going to kind of be the leader of the new like Disney Plus Avengers. Granted, we are getting Captain America 4 with him. Uh, but my guess, my guess would be Sam Wilson as Captain America shows up at some point. That would be really cool. I think uh, it's built. It's in the. I mean, there's a Captain America appearance in the comic, yeah. but it's not. I mean, of course, it's not Sam Wilson. It's 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 kept, but it's still Captain America. So they could easily swap it out and have some of the, one or two characters show up. See, I didn't even know about the him being in the comic, so I'm just gonna assume I'm gonna be right. <laughs> All right, ready for some Ahsoka news? I'm ready, Joe. Give me some Ahsoka news. Uh, well, if you've been on the internet at all within the last uh, two days, the Hollywood Reporter has an- is announcing or saying, confirming, however you want to word it, that Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker will be reprising the role in the Ahsoka series. Not a huge surprise. Yeah. I mean, of course, he's in the Obi-Wan show. We already knew that, so... I assume this is a good sign for that. Like, if it if it went terribly for him on that show, I don't think he'd be like ready for to do more stuff. I think yeah. this is a good sign that he had a good time on that show and they respected him and he felt happy with what they did with the character in enough of a way that he's really ready to come back and at least get the paycheck for the Ahsoka show, you know? And yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it makes sense though. Anakin and Ahsoka have the tightest relationship of any characters in the Clone Wars, kind of. I mean, like, yeah. er, arguably any characters in Star Wars, I'd say they have the closest relationship. Even more than Anakin and Obi Wan, so I gotta go I Han think, and Chewie, bro. Uh, no one Han and Chewie. Than Han and Chewie. You're right. They have a life debt, you know. Yeah. Han spoke Wookiee to him in the movie, so yeah. they're they're bonded forever. Yeah. Great scene. Great movie. But yeah. Classic. Uh, <laughs> Classic. I think it's, it's it makes sense for Ahsoka's uh, arc that if they're gonna do this live action show for her, whether it's like the finale to her character or what it's gonna be that they want Anakin to play a role in that. Look, Joe's holding up the easily in the fourth you know, best the, Star Wars movie ever made. Easily in the top like fifteen. All right, but yeah. So I mean, I you and I are on the same page that like ninety percent chance it's a Force ghost, right? Oh, I think for sure Force ghost. I don't know about a Force ghost, but I would. I'm honestly leaning towards like a force vision. Like she has some kind of, I don't know if it's literally going to be, oh, he shows up and he's like a glowing blue force ghost. I think it's going to be more, she has some kind of encounter, like a mortis level vision where she's seeing the force physically in front of her and she sees Anakin in some way manifested right. rather than like, oh, here's a glowing blue guy. So I'm I don't going think we're going to see ghost. a glowing blue guy. I think we're seeing a blo- glowing blue guy. I think we're going to have, see, I, I don't know if it was you I was talking to or someone else, but I think we're going to have the scene from, the Empire Strikes Back mirrored of where Obi-Wan tells Luke to go find Yoda. I think potentially season one finale is Force Ghost of Anakin telling Ahsoka to go find Luke. Interesting. I think that's a good way to use it. I, I'm i not but sure. But I think I mean, they're I'm also a... going to have a conversation. I think because part of it, a lot of people, and I agree that this that this quote unquote because originally there was going to be a sequel to the animated show Rebels and it was going to be animated then Mandalorian did far better than anyone expected to viewership wise and ratings wise and all of that and so they decided to make this Rebels sequel show uh, live action and so my thinking is season one of Ahsoka is essentially going to be from getting her to where we saw her in the Mandalorian to be you know where she looks very dingy and wearing gray to essentially the final shot of Rebels where she shows up to Sabine and she's wearing like the all white looking like Gandalf and I think that's going to be season one of getting her from where we saw her in the Mandalorian to where we see her in Rebels and then 
Season 2 of Ahsoka is essentially going to be the Rebel sequel show of Ahsoka, Sabine, Hera all going out looking for uh, Ezra and Thrawn. I think that's a good prediction because I do think we need to get that arc of how does she become that wise yeah. wise and I mage think part of that at the end wise, of Rebels. Wise, you know, mage thing like you were talking is going to be her having a conversation with Anakin and seeing like that Anakin was redeemed in the end and uh, there was yeah. always still good in him, and maybe she would. Would fans be upset if part of if Anakin says part of his redemption was like Ahsoka, like, like obviously like his redemption was you know taking out the Emperor, saving his son instead of killing his son. But if part of the redemption was like something revolving Ahsoka, like thoughts of Ahsoka and stuff like that in that moment, I like that because I think. I'm not necessarily there because I know it's like a mythical operatic storytelling, but some people think you don't redeem yourself just by doing one good thing. And some people are like, oh, Anakin, sure, you overthrew the Empire, but that, does that make up for like killing all of these people and like slaughtering younglings and all of this stuff? And like, I think that's a reasonable criticism to have of the whole st- of the Star Wars saga in general, that Anakin kind of gets an easy forgiveness at the end. But I think this show can... If they do it like you're saying, if it is kind of like, oh, he's on this redemption path where he's he's not just saving Luke, but he's saving Ahsoka, he's saving whatever other, maybe he's saving Obi Wan. I don't know. I mean, I mean that would be like kind of like some weird. They're all Force ghosts, but he's like saving Obi Wan's soul. So I don't know, but I could see that being a way of saying, oh, he didn't just save Luke. He was also doing all these other redemptive things to make him the chosen one, to make him balance the force, to have him go around and kind of right his wrongs and I think Ahsoka is one of those wrongs even if it wasn't necessarily his fault I think she feels a lot of guilt over him falling and I think if both of them I think if he was open and honest with her about how he was feeling and what he felt about the Jedi Order I think they both could have been in better paths but the fact that now that one of them were in a place where they could open up made it hard for that to happen so when he shows up in this show I think it'll be nice to see them both be on kind of the same terms and on open books to each other. There's no hiding anything anymore. So it's going to be nice to see those two characters for, for finally be able to talk to each other in a fully, truly honest way. Yeah. Do you think potentially, you know, there's a lot of thoughts of where is Ahsoka, you know, what happens to Ahsoka? Cause she's not in the, to me, she has to be completely like out of the picture by the sequel trilogy. I still go with my head canon that the world between worlds thing, she essentially time traveled through, the original trilogy she goes into the world between worlds before it starts and comes out after it ends um and that's you know essentially what i think happened but i could be proven wrong later but i think by the time of the sequel trilogy like ahsoka has to be you know completely removed so do you think there's a situation where end of ahsoka series she ends up back in mortis and she's now like the role of the father and maybe characters we meet over maybe the course of the Mandalorian or the Book of Boba Fett like one of them takes the role of the daughter and another one takes the role of the son I hadn't thought of that at all Joe but I think that's a really really smart way to end it I think yeah you mentioned like she has to in some way be maybe Ezra takes the role of the light side the good side like the role of the daughter but it's now a male and maybe a character we meet and something else is, you know, this dark side character and gets trapped in there and it takes the role of the son and it's like this evil character and Ahsoka is the one that, you know, watches over both. I would love that, honestly. I don't know how much that's going to work in terms of people who aren't super, super into the lore of Star Wars. Like if my dad watches Ahsoka and he's like, what the hell's going on with all this Mortis I feel and like all if, of this I, stuff? I feel like it's one of those things where if like Ahsoka runs for three seasons and that's how season, you know, the season three slash season finale ends, I feel like you can drop little nuggets of Mortis throughout and like slowly explain things throughout and you don't have to completely um, be like season finale, they go to Mortis and that's how it ends. I feel like it could be this kind of slow roll throughout, but also like look at Loki. I remember when we got to the season finale of Loki, we're like, oh, it has to be a Loki variant or... Uh, because nothing else makes sense. They they couldn't. No way they could introduce a new character in the season finale, have it be the big villain, and have it work. And we both agreed, like after it was over, that it worked perfectly. So. Yeah, and that is a I good trust, argument. I do think that I trust I the trust, process. I trust the process, Joe. I, I trust the, pe- the 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 poetry of Star Wars. You know, it'll all come together. Yeah. And 
my biggest hope for Ahsoka is that it's very force focused and very like kind of metaphysical in that way. So I think bringing back Mortis is a definitely a good choice, whether it's for the finale or somewhere throughout the show, I would love to see Mortis again, especially in live action. I'm getting excited just thinking about like how they would portray that in a live action show and what it would look like. And seeing all of those, seeing all of that visually played out would be really uh, just fascinating to see. So yeah, this Anakin news definitely gets me excited for the show and gets me excited for the force visions and whatever, or whatever else they're going to do in that sense of the show. Yeah. I feel like it's going to be very force heavy. Cause I was, you know, talking with someone uh, like about a couple days ago where they were talking about like rogue squadron of like, why are they making a rogue squadron? Like, space pilot movie when they can make so many other things and i think part of it it's like they're trying to balance and like make sure there's always something coming down the pipe for you know people who are fans of star wars for different reasons like if you like the more war aspect and like the blasters and the fighting and stuff okay then you have andor coming out if you like more of the underground type stuff and the villain you know the villainy the scum and villainy type of thing from star wars okay you got mandalorian and book of boba fett coming out if you like more of the Force aspect of it, you got Kenobi coming out. You've got the Acolyte coming out. And I think Ahsoka, you know, is definitely going to lean into the Force aspect of it. And I feel like they really haven't had anything like space, like space fights and, you know, any of that really outside of the, you know, 7 through 9 sequel trilogy. You know, there's really been no space fights at all. So I think that's going to cover, you know, if you're a fan of space fights, boom, you got a whole space fight movie. I like it because it adds to the variety of the range of the show too. Like, I don't expect Ahsoka to look or feel anything like Book of Boba Fett will no, or no. Mandalorian does. If no. it does, I feel disappointed, you know, because yeah. I don't, I don't think that it's going to. I mean, part of it uh, I want it to because I like the look of Mandalorian Book of, Bo- but like the aesthetic, it would look similar. But like tone and vibe and feel of the show, I want it to be completely different. Like, I almost feel like we might, it might, where this is more like Western vibes and like underground CD. Yeah vibes for what the Mandalorian was, I almost feel like Book of Boba Fett's going to be more like gangster vibes and like it's going to take more influence from like Scarface and Godfather and stuff like that. And just the one, I mean, I, Ahsoka was really only in the one episode, but that was definitely like more samurai vibes and that was the most samurai vibes we've gotten from the Mandalorian and already in just her own episode, it was a completely different tone of the show. So I, I feel like it I feel like there's like a 0% chance I watch Ahsoka and be like, oh, this has the exact same tone and feel as the Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett. Cause I don't even feel like those two shows are going to feel the same. I'm open for it. I hope the, sh- the episode is a tease for what the look and feel is going to be like for the Ahsoka show. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anything else you want to say about Ahsoka? No, I can't wait for it. It's going to be a long wait to get there, but yeah, we have a, a year or more than a year. I think it's going to be a while. Yeah, so uh, we knew this was going to be a light episode, so one of the things uh, we brought up and talked about doing was essentially because, you know, we got all of these shows on Disney+, Plus and because Disney+, Plus seems to be leaning heavily into the family aspect of, like, we're making shows for families. Like, they have shows for, like, preschoolers, and then outside of that, their shows seem to be for, like, families at large and so we were like okay based on the properties and all the you know stuff disney owns is there a show you want to see on disney plus and you know we've talked about star wars shows before and so obviously i have ideas for star wars shows i'd like to see but i personally avoided that uh but as i was thinking about it the show i want to see because we've seen the family aspect and like a family sitcom type thing i almost want a family like sitcom type thing But in the world of The Incredibles, with The Incredibles family, I think would be a really fun show. The idea, I've thought, is it's kind of a somewhat villain of the week. But there's a, you know, overarching villain that you really don't see that I imagine being like Claw from uh, Inspector Gadget. It's like this man man in the shadows, and then eventually it is revealed. And this has been my idea for... uh, the Incredibles 3 if we ever get it that the main villain is Jack Jack who has tra- who is now an adult but has traveled back in time to take out the Incredibles family because somewhere in his uh, somewhere in the timeline he went evil and he realized that the only one person people that can stop him is his family so he has to stop them before they can stop him and that is my idea for Incredibles 
basically animated sitcom. You know. I I like that. I really liked your Jack Jack twist too. I think that is a really uh, interesting use of the powers, and you can see the arc there too of them of the incredible family having to realize before they even know it that they somehow went along with Jack Jack and having to like grow as a family to stop that from happening over the course of the show. Yeah. <laughs> I like it, Joe. And I feel like you could do a lot of like the sitcommy type tropes, but you know, introduce superpowers and throw superpowers in there. Yeah, I think it would be fun to see because WandaVision had an element where it was like you're blending superhero stuff with sitcoms, and to take that to another level and have it be like a animated one, I think gives it a lot more freedom than WandaVision had to do a lot more goofy stuff. And I think The Incredibles in general is more of like a comedy, so I could definitely see them having a really good time with with that kind of stuff with it. I like your idea, Joe. I, I buy your I buy your show. Let's let's call up uh, Mr. Disney. <laughs> All right. I know you said you but, had some ideas. What were you thinking? So I I was thinking of two properties that Disney hasn't really touched yet that they have the rights to now because of whether it was purchasing a studio or whether it was them purchasing the the IP or uh, things that they have that are kind of in their back pocket now, and. The first is Chronicles of Narnia. I think that's a really uh, yeah. built-up IP with a lot of history and a lot and like a lot of story too. There's like eight books or something like that in the Chronicles of Narnia that have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And each I one think, could be a season, you know. Yeah, Disney could easily adapt that. And you mentioned this being like a family network that's trying to appeal to everyone. And I think Chronicles of Narnia could easily be a family show. It has the action for people. It has the kind of thematic, religious kind of tones to it for. People who are even older just want to get like that kind of a, a vibe, of, especially if you're old enough to have like read the books when you were younger. Or, I mean, obviously you wouldn't have been alive when they came out, but if you were someone who read them in school or something like that, you could get the nostalgia. And you also had the main, a lot of the main characters are kids going on adventures and doing adve- doing adventurous things and coming to their own. And that's that always appeals to kids. So that could, I think, Chronicles of Narnia would be a great family appealing show that Disney could do. And my yeah, last... I like that idea a lot. I'd definitely, if they were like, "Hey, we're doing a Chronicles," like they're like, "Look at Amazon doing Lord of the Rings," and we're like, "We're Disney Plus. We're gonna do Chronicles of Narnia." I'd be like, "Hell yeah, let's go!" Yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't think anything about casting or who you'd hand it off to or anything like that. But I think it could be one of those things where you hand it off to a specific director, <laughs> even for like maybe each season gets a director or something like that, because you could have like this unified vision of like, oh, the the one director is adapting the first book. Line the Wish in a Wardrobe, and then the second director is doing whatever the second one was, Prince Caspin or whatever it was called. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's ripe for some really fun adventure, too. And you can see, like, the action, the spectacle all building up. You see, you mentioned uh, the Lord of the Rings. A- Apple has Foundation. Amazon has Real Time and and Lord of the Rings. But, yeah, a lot of these sh- platforms are trying to get their next big epic. So I think Chronicles of Narnia could be Disney's epic. Can I pitch you an idea for a director of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Give me one. Uh, uh, Gore Verbinski, who directed the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie. I think that's a really good pick. He, ha- he Pirates of the Caribbean is like the one in a million thing that was like they adapted a ride at a park. Like it never should have been a good movie. No. And then it was awesome. And <laughs> yeah. like they tried to do it in, in, with Jungle Cruise and a million other things. Or, they're taking something recognizable in the IP of Disney and trying to do it again. And none of them have been as good as that. So I think you could do it. Yep. And I, I have one more here that I think is a, a property that we need to bring back to life, Joe. It needs to be rediscovered, I would say. And that property is National Treasure. You know, we got we got two incredible that, right? movies. They're doing I, like they said it and they said it and they said it, Joe. But yeah. I don't want them to say it anymore. I want them to do it. I want I want a Nick Cage led series on Disney Plus. I need a Nicolas Cage. Okay, he's training these new explorers, right? So he's he's Nick Cage. He's still crazy. He's still wild. He's still got his high energy. He's still doing his adventures, but he's training this new age of adventurers. They're gonna go out and do this ultimate job with Nick Cage as their leader, you know, so he's kind of on this leader role, leading a team who he's trying to hand off the reins of a, of a national treasure exploration uh, that he's doing, but he's not necessarily ready to let go either because he loves the, the exploration mm-hmm. of, so we're going to have that dichotomy of him being this leader who's treating people but not necessarily ready to let go, 
and then you grow up the new characters throughout the show because I wouldn't imagine Nick Cage wanting to stick around. So, you know, you get Nick Cage for a little bit and then you bring in your main characters and you have a national treasure universe built up on Disney+. Plus. Can I, can, I, can I take your idea and change it a little bit? I want to see your thoughts. Go for it, Joe. So Nicolas Cage's character, Benjamin Franklin Gates, is now uh, a college, you know, he's taken his millions of dollars, he's donated to all of these colleges, so now he's a college professor, and part of his job is he uh, has high school, a group of high school students, maybe like 10 to 15, who are all in like AP history um, at some, you know, preppy school, and these are all like these preppy kids, they don't like to get dirty, their dads are all like hedge fund managers, and they all get sent to him for like some field trip and they go and Nicolas Cage has like some mystery he's trying to solve that he doesn't think is a big deal. He doesn't want these kids around him. He doesn't want to work with these kids. These kids are young and annoying and dumb. And then before he knows it, he gets swept away on this adventure along with these kids because he f- solves one riddle, which leads to the next riddle, which leads to the next riddle. And there's your series. Is It's kind of like a 24 scenario. You could do like 10 episodes, but the whole thing takes place in a single day, just like the uh, movie. And it's all like around like New York or, you know, Washington, D.C. or, you know, California, you know, figure out what city you want to set the whole uh, season in. And there you go. I love it, Joe. National Treasure needs to come back to life. You know, defining movies of my childhood. Uh, the movies that kind of made me fall in love with Nick Cage, you know, as an actor. So we got to get him back, Joe. He's, he's having a cage of sounds, so we got to get a, a National Treasure on Disney+. Plus. I'm, I'm all for it. Whether it's a movies, I'm, I like the movies, you know, but we're, we're pitching the series, you know, and I want to get myself, you want the full adventure here. You know, you want the you want thrills. You want the mystery. You want everything building up. Give me that. Don't give me Indiana Jones series. Give me a National Treasure series. Uh, I was just about to say my next idea was a uh, animated. They're making an Indiana Jones video game. Give me an animated Indiana Jones like series, kind of in the tone and style of like a Clone Wars or Bad Batch and Rebels, kind of in that. Like where there's darker moments, but it's light, it's fun. Have him have like a little kid that's with him on his adventure. Do you think they could get uh, Harrison Ford to come back and voice Indiana Jones for like a season of a TV show? No. <laughs> just get a voice actor, you know, who's, you know, can replicate his voice and just, uh, I think you could get Harrison Ford back for like a cameo as like, oh, I'll get Hen- Harrison Ford back to voice, uh, Henry Jones Sr. for an episode. I think it could work. You know, I don't know. He, he seems like he's loving Indiana Jones and of course he went and got hurt. So maybe I still, my theory is still like. They were, like, baiting and switching him with that movie of, like, yeah, we'll do... Hey, if you come back and do episode 7, we'll make Indiana Jones 5. <laughs> and, you know, Disney was like, he's going to be too old and tired to want to do another movie before we get around to it. And then they realized, because they probably signed a contract, that the only way they could get out of it was if Harrison Ford was like, oh, I can't do this movie anymore. But Harrison Ford's too goddamn old and stubborn to ever say that he can't do a movie. <laughs> And so now they're forced to make Indiana Jones 5. And they push it back an entire year. Yeah. Like, he's gonna. how old is that man going to be by the time he comes out? I'm going to look it up. How old is... When was Harrison Ford born? Because he is old. I would say He that. is 79 years old right now. Born July 13th, 1942. When is Indiana Jones 5 release date? Will he be gonna... 81 or... Okay, June 30th, 2023. So he will be like three weeks shy of turning uh, 81. Not bad. You know, he's still an action hero in my eyes. Really, Scott just directed two movies and he's like, what, 85 or something right now? All right, so let's talk about this because this is still Disney. It's not Disney Plus. We can talk about it real quick. Do you think? Uh, do you think this is setting up another franchise? Like it's going to be called like Indiana Jones and like the Raiders or something like that. And you know, whoever the like younger people are in this movie are going to take over this franchise. Absolutely, I think they don't just do a one-off movie. I mean, I mean, that's not the way Hollywood works anymore. You know, you don't just do one-off movies. Maybe because it has an IP attached to it, you can sell it. It's like, oh, here's the finale of Indiana Jones. They're going to do one more because the last one wasn't received that well. So we're going to give you guys like a proper ending. And 
that set. But I do think at the very least, they're going to give us a, a bit of a setup for what we can get from the from the IP. Because I think they we will want to do a Disney Plus show. They will want to do a couple other movies. And maybe you introduce a team of, like you said, the Raiders or something like that, that then goes and leads a show on Disney Plus. And I think that's probably the route they want to go. Because, yeah, that's just not how Hollywood works, unfortunately, anymore. You don't just do one-off movies unless they bomb. You know, you, want, you make a movie because you want it to be a larger thing. Do you think if Mutt was better well-received, which was Shia LaBeouf's character in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, the this movie, number one, would have... Even if the rest of the movie was like considered not good, but people at least were fine with the character of Mutt, and so they never really made a sequ- like a direct one right after that, do you think there would have been a chance that like Shia LaBeouf would have been the lead of this movie? Or a different actor, depending on... Like, if they had cast Chris Pine as Mutt, Mutt's better received. Do you think this movie comes out, but Chris Pine's the lead, and Harrison Ford is more like his dad in the movie and not necessarily the lead, but he's, like, the second lead? Yeah, I think so. This movie feels kind of reactionary in that way, where it's like, okay, people didn't like Shy Fu, didn't like this or that, so we're going to cut all of that and just go back and do it again. And I think if people did like Shia's character, he would be in this movie for sure. Whether he was a lead... Or a supporting character, he'd have a pretty a big role, at least an a role, you know. And he doesn't seem like he's attached to this at all. They're gonna ignore that movie entirely. Which doesn't make sense because it's been so long. It's been like ten years that honestly, they could just like the character of Mutt. They could just be like, oh, he went to college and it's been ten years, so he's changed and just cast Shia LaBeouf and have it be a son. But really, just do whatever you want with the character and kind of completely change the character. And I feel like no one would be like that mad. He could be full on basically exactly how Harrison Ford was in Indiana Jones and just be like, yeah, you know, ever since he went to college and grew up a little bit and went off on his own, he's, you know, matured and people would be like, okay. I think that's possible because we are, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I would, I don't know what, what percentage I'd give it, but I would, would not be shocked if Shia LaBeouf had like a small cameo think, or like a one scene appearance, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Like a uh, Milo Ventimiglia in uh, Creed 2. But, yeah, because we didn't. We're in the era where people are kind of ready to see people show up again, and <laughs> I, I don't know how. Like I said, a lot of a lot of movies are like, oh, this guy's from that thing, this guy's from that thing, and uh, Halloween love three is actually good. And mm-hmm. yeah, and it's like people like the memories. So I think whether the movie's good or not, people are gonna be like, oh, it's the guy from the last one, and they're gonna. It's been long enough that people I feel like have seen way worse movies than that. You know, I can you make Crystal Skull seem bad at the time. But I feel like we've seen franchises fall flat on their face way harder than that one did since then. So I'm I'm, I'm ready to see it get a second shot. Yep. You know, he's gone to Club Obi-Wan in, I believe, Temple of Doom. So maybe in this one he'll go to Club Kylo Ren. You never know. <laughs> Adam Driver could be in it. Yeah. I didn't, even, I didn't even think about the connection of him being his son. But all right. Uh, without further ado, goodbye. Hey, thank you for watching the Movie Change Up podcast. We'd really appreciate if you liked, commented, subscribed, and shared us with anyone you think might be into what we're doing over here. Thank you. Have a nice day.